Hello again. <clears throat> so after a, a brief diversion into uh, my ebook collection uh, with the wisdom of ancient Sumer, I'd like to go back to something a little bit more recent in history and also a more physical copy. So this is called Burmese Monk's Tales by Mong Tin Ong. This is a Burmese author and I do apologize if I mispronounce any uh, Burmese names in this video or Myanmar names in this video, because uh, I, I also want to apologize if you object to my choices regarding the place names. I will mostly stick to the names as they are used in the book, because I think that's, uh, well, that's more fair to the author, honestly. Uh, and he uses the old, uh, I guess you could say colonial names, as opposed to the more, uh, more modern, um, use of Myanmar and Yangon and things like that. He says Burma, he says Rangoon, uh, and I'm gonna stick with those for the most part. Uh, I might slip and say Myanmar here and there. I don't really mean to. So Mong Tin Ong was a, a Burmese scholar. Uh, he was an ethnographer, he was a folklorist, uh, he, uh, a scholar of uh, Burmese Buddhism, and um, he was a really interesting uh, figure, but he was, more than, I think more than anything else, he was kind of known as a collector of folklore. And uh, that's sort of what this is. Not exactly, but sort of. So when he says monks tales, these aren't just folk stories as told by monks. These are ways of briefly illustrating uh, religious philosophical points uh, by by monks, mostly by one particular monk named uh, the, oh, I am very sorry about this. I know I'm gonna pronounce it wrong. The uh, Tingazar Sayadaw. Uh, Sayadaw is a, a title, not a name. Um, it basically means like the royal tutor. And it was given to monks who were, uh, monks who were uh, used by the king as either direct teachers or, or else just a, a person to talk about religious matters. And the bulk of this very brief volume is the stories told by the Tingazar Sayadaw uh, to, um, to illustrate his ideas and his philosophies. And they're not full on sermons. Uh, I think the, the sermons that he gave, no doubt, would have been much more complex, uh, much more in depth. Uh, these are just very, very brief, um, almost fable-like stories to illustrate a, a specific point. Uh, I'll give you an example. I'm just going to uh, pull up one, a, a short one at, um, at random. So I've got here the old widow and the thief. Um, and each of these has a prologue and, a, um, and the short story itself. So I'll, I'll read this to you. Um, it shouldn't take too long. Don't worry. Stick around. <clears throat> so prologue. During one of his sojourns in Lower Burma, the Tingazar Sayadaw made a pilgrimage to the famous Kyaktyo Pagoda in Taton district. As he and his retinue rested at the foot of a hilly slope, a crowd of villagers assembled to pay their respects to the great monk. A young monk passed by, and some of the villagers said, my lord, this monk's this monk lives in one of the valleys nearby, and although he has never preached any sermon, he seems to be very learned and pious. People from nearby villages go to his hut monastery regularly and offer him alms food and robes. Please, go and invite him to come here and meet me, the Sayadaw requested. So one of the villagers ran after the young monk and informed him that the great monk, the Tingazar Sayadaw, wished to see him. The young monk, however, pretended not to hear. The villager repeated the message many times, but the young monk quickened his pace and disappeared down the valley. The villagers were embarrassed, but they insisted, in spite of his refusal to come before my lord, we are sure that he is a good monk. Good layman, replied the Sayadaw, like the old widow, I can only hope that he is good. So that's the prologue. Then this is the actual story of the old widow and the thief that the monk then tells to illustrate the point he's trying to make. The old widow had sold her small harvest of paddy at sundown, and so she had no time to take the money to the village headman for safe custody or to call in one of her neighbors to come and stay in the house for the night. At first she was not nervous, but when the cocks crew their first watch and dogs began their barking, she became frightened. 
Getting up from bed, she sat by the window and looked out into the darkness. The barking of the dogs became more and more furious, and she heard the sound of approaching footsteps. Who is there? She shouted out, but there was no answer. She lit the torch, which was ready in her hand, and raised it across the window. Who's there? She called out again. Only a good man, came the answer from the darkness. If you are really a good man, suggested the widow, you should come into the torchlight. I am a good man, but I cannot come into the torchlight, replied the intruder. Come into the torchlight so that I can recognize you, ordered the old widow. I am a good man, insisted the man from the darkness, but now I am going away. The old widow waited until the sound of the footsteps of the intruder faded in the distance and the dog ceased to bark. Then she sighed to herself, I can only hope that he was a good man. So you can kind of see that there's a charm to these stories. Um, they are almost Aesopian, like they're like Aesop's fables, except for the fact that for the overwhelming majority of these, I think there's only one or two that have animals as important parts, the characters are people. Um, but they're just used to illustrate very basic um, moral lessons or practical lessons. In this case, um, you know, don't just take someone at their word. Uh, don't just rely on your your faith if someone doesn't uh, if someone cannot prove their their worth or their value or their safety. Um, and uh, I think a lot of them are a little bit um, hard to grasp the lesson, I'll say, if you are not familiar with the context of Burma in the 19th century. Uh, but even if you're not, I think a lot of them are very charming and interesting and fun to read, certainly. And, uh, you know, the what's one of the things that I think is really interesting is this is, these are all oral. Uh, they're collections of sayings of the Tingasar Sayadaw and other monks as well. and there is a very brief section at the end of the book. Um, yeah, the the book as a whole is um, okay. So the book as a whole is only 163 pages, and at the last 14 of them are stories from other monks. And just from looking at those uh, at those stories, you can see that there's some of the charm but they're nowhere near as interesting or entertaining as the Tingasar Sayadaws. So you can kind of get, even just from these written down, probably bodlerized versions of, uh, of these sayings and stories, you can still get the greatness of this one particular monk and the uh, creativity and voice that he had. Um, but it's still interesting to hear these other monk stories and to see that there was some variety in the way that they told their stories, the way that they um, illustrated their moral points. The other really interesting thing about this book is the time that it was taking place. This was happening in the late 1800s, Lower Burma, the area around the capital, uh, Rangoon or Yangon, if you're using the, the modern phrase, um, had already been taken over by the British. But Upper Burma, the area around the old capital, Mandalay, uh, was still independent, but it was becoming increasingly clear to just about everyone, both in the country and in the outside world, that it was only a matter of time before the British would conquer it. And you can certainly hear the um, this kind of atmosphere of dread that permeates through these. Overall, I would say that this is a very um, uplifting, positive uh, collection of stories. Um, and a lot of that is just, you know, the charm of the village. You know, the village life is interesting and uh, and it's in its simplicity, uh, it's enjoyable to read about. But there is definitely that element of something is coming to an end and our traditional way of life or their traditional way of life is at risk and it's clearly recognizable. Uh, in fact, uh, toward the end of the Tingazar Sayadaw section, we have um, a few of his, um, well, a few of his uh, statements uh, about, in which he had basically given into despair about the state of his own country. And it's really sad to read. Um, for uh, for example, here, um, this is a, a conversation with Colonel Olcott. Uh, 
I'll, I'll read this one in its entirety as well and then talk about it a bit. Colonel H.S. Olcott, the American philanthropist who played a great part in the revival of Buddhism in Ceylon, Sri Lanka, had been touring Burma and he said to the, to the Tingazar Sayadaw, my Lord, in spite of your great efforts to keep the light of Buddhism burning in lower Burma, the monks seem to be neglecting the religion. Admittedly, because of your prestige as a monk of great learning and absolute purity, the monks are now well disciplined and well behaved, but they have as a body discarded their role of teachers of religion and morality to the people and have become mere civil servants in the pay of the British government. Accepting stipends from the new government, they now spend their time teaching elementary mathematics and surveying to their pupils in their monasteries. Great layman, replied the Sayadaw, at the beginning of the rainy season, the farmer plows his large field, and at the same time, in one small corner, he makes a nursery of small paddy plants. As the rain continues to fall, he anxiously digs drains around his nursery to keep away the water. In ordinary times, he can manage to keep his nursery above water, but in a year of catastrophic deluge, floods will occur, the young plants in the nursery will die, and after the floods have abated, the field will remain barren because no transplanting can take place. Great layman, I am the farmer, the monasteries are my nurseries, and Lower Burma is my field. I could have dealt with an ordinary deluge of new ideas, but not with a catastrophic flood. Alas, have you, as you have noted, my nurseries are now underwater, and I cannot hope to drain it out. And that just hits you right here, you know? Um, you, you can hear that sense of, you know, sorrow, depression, that there's nothing he can do to stop the incoming colonial tide of uh, foreign rule, new ideas, and modernization. And, um, you know, it's really tragic, and it's, it's sad to hear it, but it's also great that we have this window uh, that we can see um, from the point of view of a knowledgeable, intelligent observer uh, what was happening at the time from a Burmese point of view, not from an outsider's point of view, not from a historian's point of view, but someone who was actually there witnessing it. I wish we could get a little, a little bit more detail of the things that he saw and the things that he uh, believed were coming, but what we have here, I think, is really something special, really precious. Um, so another short video. I think we're gonna say thank you again for coming and uh, Hope you enjoyed. See you next time.